Hello, everyone. My hey. name is Kent C. Dodds, and uh, I guess I could say we are live with JavaScript Air. <laughs> so um, for those of you who are not familiar in the audience, JavaScript Air is a live broadcast podcast all about JavaScript and the web platform. And uh, we just started in December, so we've got a handful of shows on JavaScriptAir.com. Um, and this show will be available hopefully within the next week uh, when, I, when I can get the, uh, the audio off a bit. But uh, I just, quick shout out to our sponsors. Um, we have Egghead.io as our premier sponsor. They have bite-sized videos and they're amazing, awesome. Uh, Frontend Masters is also a training website. Check them out. Uh, we're sponsored by TrackJS, uh, error tracking. They're fantastic. Uh, and CodeCove is a code coverage platform. Uh, it's awesome. And WallabyJS, uh, they do uh, live code coverage as you're typing your code. It runs your code. Like, it's amazing. Go, go check them out. Um, OK. so. Um, I should probably go ahead and introduce our panel. And I don't have my regular Google Doc in front of me, so I'm kind of nervous. But luckily, I've got this. <laughs> so we've got uh, Cassandra Perch and Tyler McGinnis and Alan Wurfsbrock and uh, Brian Lensdorf and Kyle Simpson. Um, and Brian, Kyle, and Tyler are regular panelists on the show. I'm your host, Kent C. Dodds. And Alan and Cassandra have graciously um, accepted the invitation to uh, join our, our conversation. Cassandra, like five minutes ago. So thank you, Cassandra. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So um, b I, I think a good uh, kickoff for our show is actually to get an introduction to our guests, because they're not on the show every week. And so why don't we get an intro to you, Cassandra? Give us like 60 seconds of who you are, what you do. Uh, sure. So I'm a developer evangelist at Auth0 during the day. Uh, I like to talk about user and identity management. Um, and then when I'm not doing that, I'm building NodeBots and supporting the NodeBots community and um, absolutely gushing about everything I love about NodeBots. So that's pretty much what I do. <laughs> awesome. And totally loved your talk this morning. Anybody watching at home, go watch that talk. It was very, very good. Also, uh, you just had a show with JavaScript Jabber about Auth0, right? I did. I did. It was really good. Cool. I was listening to it this morning. So <laughs> JavaScript Jabber is a great podcast, not our podcast, but uh, listen to both. <laughs> so, Alan Wurfstrack, could you give us an intro? Sure. Yeah. Um, good, this is on now. Uh, yeah, so, so I guess my main claim to fame for this room was that I was the project editor for the development of the ECMAScript 2015 ES6 specification. And I was actually a uh, project editor for also ES5 and ES5.1. So, uh, and what that means in the world of JavaScript. Uh, develop, standards development is for ES6 is, I essentially wrote most of the standards. I, I didn't necessarily make all the decisions of what needed to be written down, but it was my job to actually figure out uh, most of the actual specification material. Uh, my, uh, before that, I've done lots of things over a long career. Uh, I'm a, d a dynamic language guy. I uh, was really heavily involved in the early emergence of object-oriented programming technology and the small talk programming language and building high-performance virtual machines and lots of other things. And that's kind of what ultimately led me to uh, JavaScript. Cool. Thank you. You have a very interesting background. <laughs> so um, before we get into asking questions, uh, the, I'll just give a little bit of the format of this. For about um, uh, 20 minutes, we're going to be just chatting amongst ourselves. Um, probably generally about uh, ES6, ES2015, uh, and 2016. Um, and then um, for the last 10 minutes or so, we're going to be taking questions from the audience. And the way that we do this on the JavaScript Air Show is through Twitter. Um, and so at, at the last little bit, I'll uh, pull out my phone, so don't think I'm being rude. Um, and I'll, I'll be watching the JS Air question hashtag. So that's JS Air question. Um, and so if you have a question during the show uh, that, that you'd like to ask, just go ahead and tweet to that hashtag, and I'll, um, answer, I'll bring up as many as we can um, in the time that we have. So great. I think a good starter question for our panel uh, is, is it ES7 or ES2016? It's, it's ES2016. Can you explain a little bit about the reasoning behind that? Sure. Um, you know, going well. So first of all, historically, there's there's been a kind of confusion about these numbers and numbers getting bound too early 
do particular things. In particular, there was a whole effort to develop ES4, which then ne never happened, and we kind of had to skip that number, which was sent shock through the world of standards people because that's actually a document revision number, yet there was no revision for. And um, so after the long, long effort to develop what we all knew as ES6, um, in TC39, we really wanted to move towards smaller, more incremental releases on a yearly basis and stuff. Uh, and doing that, we just fores foresaw the, that having a, a string of kind of meaningless integer numbers, you know, once we went through four or five or six of those was, was going to be kind of meaningless. And so we just sort of decided to bite the bullet and say, okay, we're going to start uh, identifying the, the standard revisions by the year they were released. Um, in, the, in the long run, uh, the feeling is most people don't need to talk about those numbers, right? It's, it's just, it's really just JavaScript. That's really all you need to say is, is, is JavaScript, the, you know, the current JavaScript standard and... Uh, um, so, sorry to derail it really quick. Um, if you're moving your head, and that's okay to move your head, just make sure you move your mic with you. So oh, sure, not, sure, not sure. Talking like this, nobody, nobody can hear this, right? So, okay, but uh, that's that's really interesting. Uh, so, I think this is really big for the JavaScript community that we're going to be having year, yearly releases. Um, can you talk a little bit about the process uh, for uh, getting features into JavaScript? Yeah. Um, so, so TC39 is the standards committee that is responsible for developing JavaScript. Um, and um, it, it's made up of members who represent companies and stuff. And it's, it's that group of organizations and the people who represent them that, who actually make the, the decision of what is going to go into revisions of the JavaScript standard. Um, and during the development for ES 2015, ES 6, that was a pretty ad hoc process. Is people would, would write proposals, and over real, real, sort of a long period of years, actually, those proposals would evolve and consensus would be built. And then dozens and dozens of these went into making the final standard. Uh, to, to have a more incremental process, what we're doing now is we actually have identified a stage of developments that go from, we number them stage zero to stage four, where stage zero is what we call a straw man, which is sort of a wacky idea, and it progresses from sort of wacky idea to, yes, the committee th thinks there's a problem here that's worth working on, that's stage one, to stage two is, Here's the shape of the solution that we think we're going to follow. The stage three is, here's actually a specification of what we think we're going to do, and we'd like people to, to try this in browsers and stuff, to stage four, where, yep, this is, this is locked down, it's complete, and it's going to be in the next edition of the standard. So how long it takes a particular feature to go through that process, the, depends on the size of what we're talking about. If it's a very small change, like the uh, exponentiation operator, it can go through, through those phases uh, quite quickly over a matter of months. If it's a large and complex uh, set of features, like async functions, um, it can take years. It's likely to take years. Uh, but, but that's basically the process. And then when the yearly releases come out, it's basically uh, about this time of the year, we look and see, well, what's at stage four? Those are the things that go into the, the next official version of the standard, which it will be released in June. So you've mentioned that uh, stage zero is kind of, the, you use, I think, the, the term wacky ideas. Well, they may, they may uh, or may not be wacky, sure, but, but, they're, but they're just, you know, um, they're we new. call it straw man, sure. right? It's, it's, wouldn't it be interesting to do X? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so uh, with tools like Babel, uh, now all of a sudden those stage zero uh, ideas are starting to, to get more adoption in actual like production code bases. Uh, what's your opinion? Is, is that a good thing because you kind of get to test it before it actually goes into spec or is that a bad thing because all of a sudden we have entire communities around stage zero features? Um, well, well, it's risky. I think as, as an app developer, you, 
really, if you're going to be using Babel in that way and uh, using experimental features, you really need to be aware of the staging process and where they are. Uh, if you really become dependent upon a stage zero feature, uh, you're really taking a lot of risk. Uh, you're taking a risk that, I mean, that, that may never go anywhere. Uh, it may be that the feature the actual implementation, the actual details of it changes in a way that's totally incompatible with what you've done. So you, you, have, you really have to weigh the, uh, the risks there against the benefit. I mean, how badly do you need that? If so, uh, when you, so you're talking about these stages mm -hmm. of features. And I think one of the ones most people probably are kind of anxious about is the async await, which I think at its current status, it's stage three. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. So it almost made it into what we are going to know as ES 2016, uh, but it didn't quite make it. So let's just say that it comes out a week after, it makes it to stage four a week after you've put the official stamp on ES 2016. So it will eventually, 11 and a half months later, make it into a spec, but how do we talk about that thing for that potentially 11 and a half months? Uh, do we start saying, well, this is ES 2017 because it's already stage four? How do we talk about these features? Async functions. I mean, I mean, I mean that, that, that's the name of the feature. If something is at stage four, that means on the, uh, the TC39 GitHub, GitHub site, there will be a complete specification for that feature. And stage four means that specification is, is essentially frozen. It's not been fully integrated into the you know, the thick document that defines the entire language, but it's, it's, it, the intent is that it's not going to change from that stage four specification. Uh, also to be at stage four means that it has to have been implemented in browsers. I mean, there has to be at least some browsers out there that's already implemented the, the feature. So, um, so, you know, it's there. And I just, so I just talk about the feature by whatever the name of the feature is. But to push on that just a little bit, features are never finished, right? There's always subject to, so a, a great example is what we know of as classes that landed in ES 2015, ES 6. Uh, there's already several proposals that look like they're likely to land at some point in the future that augment that syntax, change some of its semantics, things like that. So there does seem to be a need um, in the discussion of features to say, well, I'm talking about the ES6 class versus the ES2018 version of class. And I, I assume that the same may be true of other features like async await. There may be things that land in that initial spec and things that are at the same time being worked on for a potentially later spec. Well, sure. I mean, take something that's even in some ways more pervasive, just say regular expressions. Uh, there is uh, certainly room for uh, evolution and of regular expressions and additional features, but most people most of the time don't, don't need to make that distinction. If you make that distinct, if you really need to make that distinction, um, make it. Say, you're, I'm talking about this proposed extension to classes, or I'm talking about the ZZZ ex extension to regular expressions, or, or, or what have you. Um, um, or put it another way, how do, you, how do you address this problem? How do you talk about emerging HTML features? Right? Is, is how, is, is, what is unique about this issue to JavaScript? Uh, the fact that basically when HTML5 came out, they said, that's it. There's no more after HTML5. So it's all HTML5, even though it came years after. Well, but it's still continually evolving. Like maybe CSS is a better example, but it makes sense. Um, I, I did have a quick question, if I could interject. Is that, do yeah. we feel like okay with that last answer? <laughs> I was just wondering if you have any focus on a particular paradigm or um, way of programming in JavaScript. Like, is there a, like a guiding light for adding features? Like, I see we added classes, but then I also see a proposal for a flat map. Are, you know, are we looking at something like Scala in the future? So, uh, so JavaScript, I guess the way I would characterize it is a multi-paradigm dynamic programming language, dynamically typed programming language. 
Um, and I think, at least from the perspective of TC39, that's what we intend to maintain it as. And so we, we look at all the paradigms, programming paradigms that are in use, um, and look at how well uh, they're being served by the language. And if there are deficiencies in the language where some improvements can improve the, an object-based approach, we, we look at augmenting the language there. If there are deficiencies from a functional approach, we, uh, we look at what those deficiencies are and, 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 and try to fill them. And, but maintaining this idea that it's a multi-paradigm language, and, and one of the characteristics of a multi-paradigm language is that features that support these differing paradigms still have to fit together and, and create a, a co coherent whole, a coherent design. So we have to look not just in terms of a functional style, but we have to look at well, how all these functional features fit in when people are using more object-oriented features and stuff. So, okay. so uh, Cassandra, I actually had a question for you um, that I, I'm interested in your perspective on the um, progression of the language. Um, and in your talk, you talked about a tool that you used to take a JSON object and convert it into C code. And what was the name of, name of that again? Uh, Babelbots. Babelbox? B bots, like. Uh, Babelbots. So, yeah. I thought that was, when I first saw that, I was like, well, that's kind of an inconvenient naming, kind of confusing because we have Babel. But then in what it actually does, it kind of does something similar to what, what Babel does. Um, but uh, what? Uh, what's your take on the um, new specification? What does that mean for the NodeBots community? Um, with, like, do you see in the NodeBots community, are they using the latest version of, of the language with Babel or anything like that? Um, so that's kind of, um, it, we're just now getting to that. So basically, uh, Node Serial Port had some issues when Node moved to four and uh, adopted a lot of these, these new features. So uh, we just now, uh, I think t in December, got uh, Johnny 5 and Node Serial Port working consistently with Node 4. So we're starting to see more and more of these features come into NodeBots. And from a, from a global perspective, what I've found is a lot of the features that are new to JavaScript make it a little easier to teach, especially for users that are coming from different languages. Because of that multi-paradigm outset of JavaScript, if you're looking at someone who's never coded before, you can teach them one way. But if you're looking at someone who's come from uh, a background where they used to program 15 years ago, but they're just now getting back into coding, um, you can also kind of lead that. And so because NodeBots has such a core in education, these new features are really starting to help us out in um, creating better curriculum and teaching people faster and teaching people code that they can easily translate from NodeBots into a career in web development. Cool. Tyler, what's your uh, take on that, being kind of an edu education in general? Have you seen ES6 and, and the future specification being easier to teach? So it's tricky because I think it is, but then you have this problem of beginners get into the field and they go, I don't know if I should learn like ES5 or I've seen that question a lot. Like, do I learn ES5 or do I learn ES6? And even though e I think ES6 uh, has done a great job as far as like making it easier to come from different programming languages, uh, it's, it is tricky and this is kind of a natural thing that happens to beginners because now they have like two choices and the obvious answer is like we'll just learn JavaScript. You can start with ES5, it's like the same thing almost like as you were mentioning earlier. Uh, but I think because we do put such a, such a distinct point between this is ES5 and this is ES6 and now this is ES whatever, uh, that makes it a little, a little frustrating for beginners but uh, we can't just kind of stop the whole progression of the, the language for beginners. So. I think the challenge is that browsers support different things. And so uh, just today I had somebody ask me, what's the browser support for array prototype sum? Um, because uh, you, you really, uh, unless you look into the documentation, you don't know what am I OK to use? What do I need to polyfill? Uh, Kyle, what do you think about uh, this subject? Yeah, I, <clears throat> I definitely think that there are lo lots of differences between the browsers. And rather than being scared of those differences, I think we should actually embrace that idea. I'm glad that Chrome tries out a feature first and Edge is working on a different feature and Firefox is working on a different feature. I think that that helps and the way we normalize that of course is through the, the use of tools. So some people have, have sort of asserted the idea that uh, transpilation tools are, are kind of like a temporary thing and a, a stop gap and eventually go away. My perspective from the outside, I'm not on the committee, but my perspective on the outside, JavaScript's going to keep going and there's always going to be a gap between what they just came up with and what I can use for 
supporting you know, customers. So there's always going to be a need for that tooling gap. Now, with respect to teaching, I always think we're going to have to take a new feature and teach it in the context of how we did that thing in the version before. And that's how I've approached with ES6, is to say, I'm not just going to teach you destructuring, or I'm not just going to teach you this feature of ES6. I'm going to show you how we did that thing before and why this new declarative approach makes the code more understandable, more readable, more teachable. So, but at some point, we're going to um, pretty much do uh, maybe, uh, I, I'm destructuring might not be a perfect example, but uh, destructuring will be just like such a ubiquitous part of the language that all browsers support it. Any, anything that you're shipping um, or, or any environment you're shipping to will support this feature. So um, in, in that circumstance, you know, years down the road, are you, do you still plan to teach in that uh, method or will you just kind of teach it just like you teach um, other like property accessors? I think, I think consistent with the way I teach everything that I teach about JavaScript, I don't just want you to use a feature as the sugar that's presented and not understand what it's doing. So destructuring is actually a perfect example because there is a set of primitive operations that all of this syntax sugar maps to. And that's not just an implementation detail, that's an understanding detail. It helps me to get a better mental model of what all of these new curly braces in different places that I've never seen before. Why are they there? Why is there an equals there? Well, I need to understand what the fundamental operation to emulate that would be. And right now, that's a bridge between my current understanding of JavaScript and the new stuff. But five years from now, I still am going to want you to understand what destructuring is doing so you know why it's important. Uh, that reminds me of uh, Ashley Williams' talk from JSConf uh, in May of last year uh, about the abstractions and the teaching abstractions. Uh, he's right. Like, it'll always be an abstraction, no matter how uh, integral or how day-to-day -day it is a part of the language. We'll still have to teach why that abstraction works and what that abstraction does. Because if you pr present an abstraction to a student without explaining it, eventually that's going to go, it, it's going to go down a bad path of they're either not going to understand it correctly because they, they don't know how it works or something like that. So yeah, it, it, I definitely back up Kyle's point. We're going to have to teach it like, like an abstraction because it's still what it is, no matter what. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I was just going to ask if you feel that you need to know exactly what's happening under the hood a lot more when you're working in robotics than, so as more sugar gets presented, the further you get away from like memory management and things that you um, kind of want to have control over. Is that a thing? Um, that's a great question. So um, to to give some preface to this, I have exactly zero formal electrical engineering training. Uh, I knew zero C until I started doing any, like about a year into NodeBots when I started wanting to build things uh, that required some C. Um, so I mean, yes and no. Um, you start to learn how the things work as you as you build up to them, but like it's certainly not a prerequisite for getting into robotics. You don't need to already know C to get into robotics, but you will pick up some C and some memory management while you're while you're doing it but it's not nearly as hard as people seem to think so that's that's a good thing to have a layer of competency understand wherever you're at under, have some competency understanding of the stuff in the layer below mm -hmm. uh, yeah. so that you're making proper decisions and I, I think even on a, on a broader term I found that beginners uh, or when you're new to JavaScript it's really helpful to talk kind of about the history of JavaScript and how we've got here. I don't think we do that enough in teaching uh, because in my experience is when we talk about like, hey, we just had like pure DOM manipulation and then like MooTools came and jQuery came. That's super refreshing because I'll, what, what the newcomer is seeing is they're seeing this like how we've adapted and we've started to fix these problems rather than just jumping into like the virtual DOM and they don't really know how we got there and they just take that for like dogma or doctrine. Uh, I, th I think if, if you are starting out or if you're teaching someone starting out, it's, it's really, really helpful to kind of just start at the beginning, like 1995 uh, and, and whether it takes a while to get to where we are, I think them seeing the history of how we got here and the problems we solved getting here is, is really, really helpful. So, um, so I wonder, um, See, one perspective I take on JavaScript is it's just yet another programming language. And if you're teaching somebody C or C++ or Python or whatever, I mean, would you go through that same thing? Would you try to go, you know, go back to the, the, er, the early stages of those languages? Uh, or in particular, would you do that with a beginner or would you, should you spend that time really focusing on kind of the fundamental concepts and... Uh, I mean, so, so a four-year CS degree, that's exactly what they do, right? I, I don't have right. a CS degree, so I don't know. Uh, but I think there, there's at least some merit in that. And I don't know, I mean, the, the difference between like JavaScript and even like C, there's a lot more history with C, uh, I think. 
Um, so, so I think it works with JavaScript. I, I'm not educated enough in the, the other complicating factor there, of course, is that JavaScript has to interact with all these other things that actually aren't JavaScript, like the DOM and the other web platform features. A lot of people think of that stuff as JavaScript mm -hmm. and don't understand the history of that stuff. Uh, so you may not necessarily need to go back and look at what ES1 said about JavaScript before we had try-catch, for example. Uh, but understanding the, the context that JavaScript has interacted with those other things, I think, is useful. And maybe, maybe there isn't as much of an analog in the C world because it seems like you kind of do most everything all in one. You're maybe not as interacting with a DOM from your C program like we have to do in our JavaScript programs. Well, plus, uh, to go back to Kyle's point about like having a basic competency, um, from a career perspective, knowing the history of a programming language can be very important to its future. Um, for instance, when I was teaching Node two years ago, I had to teach the rift between IOJS and Node.js because we didn't know who was going to come out on top. We didn't know what set of features was going to, to take over. So like, knowing the history of a programming language can affect you as a developer because you don't, you, you'll know a little bit more about where that language is going feature-wise, uh, popularity-wise. You, know, you can kind of see what's going on on the horizon, and it, and it can really affect how, uh, what you want to learn and how you want to do things in that language. Yeah, I mean, I totally agree that knowing that multiple programming languages and knowing the history of programming languages is really important. Probably the most important thing you can do if you want to have a long career in, in, in the software world is understand many programming languages and stuff because over time they're going to change. No matter what it looks like today, 10 years, 20 years from now, it's going to be different. So, so absolutely, you need to do that. Um, but I'm not sure whether it comes exactly at the beginner stage or it's more downstream a bit once you've mastered a programming language. Now you need to start looking at other programming languages and history and stuff. That's right, too. I think we're painting with a very broad brush because, uh, for example, someone who's like an entrepreneur doesn't really care that uh, Brennan like, made the language, right? Uh, they just want to build something. They just want to like, make money. Uh, where someone who's planning on getting into a career as a software engineer, I think that's, it's more critical to them. Uh, yeah. to, Sorry, just to kind of continue on that point, uh, Dave Smith wrote a recent article re um, that was all about the importance of learning to learn. And I think that's uh, something that we, uh, we kind of overlook. We, we just think, OK, I'm an Angular developer, and so I'm just going like, to build Angular for the rest of my life. And that, like, that is not advisable. So um, learn, learn JavaScript, but then don't forget to uh, just learn to learn. Um, and JavaScript is an amazing language. I love programming in it, but I'm not going to be doing it till the day I die. I'm, I'm almost positive of that. You'll be programming in Haskell soon. That's exactly what I'm planning on. Actually, no, JavaScript is going to kill me, so I actually will be doing it <laughs> till the day I die. So, Thank you for that. So, so, so <laughs> let me, I want to throw out here kind of my perspective on where JavaScript fits in the world for the, for the long term and kind of why I decided it was important to get involved with JavaScript. Um, I think JavaScript's position in computing for the next 30 to 40 years is comparable to the position C had for the last 30 years. It is sort of the canonical language that defines, that is central to an era of computing. Uh, and that there are, will be variations in dialects. Because you can, with C, you can say, well, there's C and there's C++. You can say Java is a, is a variant of that and stuff. But at its core, if you're thinking about what it took to develop personal computing technology, PC technology, C was the programming language that was at the foundation for that. And I think the things we're going to be doing for the next 30 or 40 years, it's JavaScript is going to be at the foundation of that. There will be many other languages. Uh, JavaScript is going to evolve incredibly. There may well be dialects of it and stuff. But, you know, it, it really is uh, the central language going forward here. I can see that in the hardware world. Um, more like basically, I, I haven't seen a hardware platform come out um, that that had a ton of traction that didn't have a seat at the table for JavaScript developers, either via a dedicated JS SDK or supporting a third-party JavaScript SDK or even making JavaScript one of their core tenants. So especially definitely in the hardware and IoT space, um, JavaScript's earned a seat at the table, and so I, I think that kind of reinforces that. Cool. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to cut it short. We've got about four minutes or so 
Um, and we do have a couple questions on Twitter. This has been actually a really awesome conversation. I wasn't planning on talking about education so much, and I'm, I'm glad that we did because I think that's really important in our community. So uh, here we have a couple of questions from uh, Crowdsource Labs. Doesn't it take longer than a year for browsers to come up to a new standard? How will they ever keep up? Um, well, the, the releases we're doing are much, much smaller, right? It, 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 will, take, it, it will take a good browser probably uh, about two or three weeks to implement the new features that are in ECMAScript. There are two in ECMAScript 2016, yeah. so, the uh, exponentiation operator. That, that's the whole point, is, is to not have these huge baskets of interdependent features that take forever to implement. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, a common misconception just because ES6 was so big that um, many people think that each year it's just going to be like this huge evolution of the language, which would be really dangerous for the language in my opinion. Um, and so, yeah, and this actually kind of touches on to Thomas um, Bernie's question. Briefly, which ES2016 feature is the most exciting to each panelist? And there, there are literally two features in ES2016. Um, and so... Um, <laughs> Uh, Fight so, me over the exponentiation operator, man. Yeah. I'm dying on I, that I one. need that. Um, I, I'm all over it. Yeah, Kyle actually has a new course uh, on that, don't you, coming out? Yeah. No, but let's, let's talk really quickly, and, and like Thomas said briefly, um, about each, each one of our favorite ES6, or ES Next feature, I guess we could say. <laughs> so uh, for me, I think probably my favorite is, uh, oh man, destructuring. I love destructuring. I think it's awesome. It makes things really expressive, declarative. So... Um, as someone who has to deal with third-party data on a regular basis, where I just kind of have to move one property to the other, I really love the arrow syntax. I really like classes. That was a joke. Uh, uh, so this, this one sounds... I sorry, thought we were going to avoid classes. We, couldn't, we, could, we had to mention classes once in here. Yeah, right. we got to. Uh, so this is a really easy one, but I don't, know, I don't know why I like it so much, but I really love template strings. I don't know if it's because I'm just like not that smart and it just made sense, but I really like this. So in the long run, I think the, the module design is going to have the most impact and influence of anything that's in uh, ES 2015. Nice. I, I like fat arrows. I'm a lambda kind of person. <laughs> uh, so for current features, I would say, other than destructuring, I would say generators. Because, uh, you know, from a, to borrow a mathematical term, sort of squaring the circle that's a thing, the thing that generators allow is a synchronous looking, asynchronous programming. And that is something that we really just didn't have a paradigm for. The, the, the state machine equivalent of that was just so bad that nobody ever did it. And I think that is leading the way into async await and other patterns that are coming uh, likely beyond that. I think that was one of the biggest paradigm shifts that we got was getting that sort of feature and understanding how with promises that will change asynchronous programming. Cool. That's definitely one, one thing that I haven't actually used yet. So I, I need to get on that, that train. Kyle said so. so. <laughs> um, OK, so uh, we have two more questions and one more minute. So uh, this is from Tom McCurl, who I think is in the audience. Um, hi, Tom. Yep. There he is. Um, he says, when teaching a beginner ES6, do you think arrow functions glaze over understanding context? How do you handle that? I think the answer is yes. Um, but how do you handle this? I, I can speak to this I, for Kyle and I. Uh, so I think, I think you shouldn't mention arrow functions before you teach context. Uh, I think that's the answer in 15 seconds. Uh, I don't teach arrow functions. Or just don't. Don't I, even teach them. <laughs> Screw them. I don't teach arrow functions because I don't think that they are actually useful for getting rid of the function keyword the way most people seem to think. There's one particular use case, which is giving you a lexical environment for the this keyword or the arguments object. I did an analysis of my own code, and that touched about 2% of the code that I've ever written. So on the whole scope of things, it doesn't seem that compelling to me. I'm a fan of them, but I agree with, I agree that you teach context long before you teach arrow functions, if you would teach a beginner arrow functions at all. Yep, I, I feel the same way. Um, I, I think arrow functions, the utility for arrow functions for me is not the lexical this, which it probably should be, but it's, it's more the... Uh, um, ability to have one-liners, and I just love that. Well, I, I want to jump in there and say, from a fun functional perspective, um, you're striving to write a single expression without that's going to always return something. And if I use fat arrows, I know I'm doing it correctly. If I if I have the curly braces and have to do return and all this stuff, I guess you know, functional uh, the word function will make you have to uh, write return, and it gives you a lot more freedom to not write a single expression. So. Yeah, cool. So. 
we are just a second over or two, so you can feel free to leave, but I'm going to ask this last question. So, <laughs> um, so uh, this is Ramana Venkata, who is actually one of my uh, hero developers in the code mod world. Um, but he says, many people seem to be unhappy with promises swallowing errors. Is there a way to make this situation better? Uh, <clears throat> they, they've already made, the, and by they, I mean the web platforms the browser platform and the node platform have already mostly solved this by adding, uh, there was a spec for unhandled rejection. So it's kind of like the new school way of window.on error. Uh, it's a way to catch something if you forgot to put on your catch you know, uh, method on your promise chain or something like that. I would say chaining of promises is absolutely the least important part of promises. So I don't get all that worried about it because I'm going to be using, like I said, the, the, the async await or the generator form, the synchronous syntax with tries and catches. So I'm not all that concerned about it. And I think if you get too obsessed about creating these long promise chains, then you have to worry a lot more about that problem where these other patterns kind of solve that for you. Yeah, that's a perfect answer. Uh, enough said. So um, that's our show. I want to give a shout out to our uh, silver sponsor, O'Reilly uh, Fluent Conf. Uh, they're going to happen in three, four weeks. Um, and we do have a discount code on our deals page if you go to javascriptair.com slash deals. And we have several other deals on there that are totally legit. Um, and if you have suggestions for the show, go to suggest.javascriptair.com. And that's a Google form you can fill out. If you have feedback, feedback.javascriptair.com. Totally appreciate your feedback. And with that, I'd just like to thank uh, Cassandra and Alan for joining us uh, on the show. And thank you all for joining us as well. Thank you. Mm -hmm.